We are here to talk about power and influence, particularly in the commercial age, and that's what the discussions so far have been about. And in your book with Jared Cohen, you make it very clear that there are big vulnerabilities out there for institutions. Something profound is happening. Governments are dangerously behind the curve. Are they waking up to what you and others are identifying now? Well, they're certainly waking up to the impact of the Internet, and I think the overwhelming message from the Internet is that it makes your country better, it makes your citizens happier, it gives you opportunity for e-commerce and education. The story of the smartphone, uh, which we take for granted here, is revolutionary in two-thirds of the world. To give you some of the numbers, um, there's on the order of 2.4 billion users of the internet, roughly 3.7 billion mobile phone users, actual users. Uh, the number of smartphones uh, is well in excess of a billion, 80% uh, of which are Android, I should add. And um, that, those numbers are all growing. This is a fantastic change. And it's probably the one hugely common thing going on in the world today. I'm very, very proud of it. It comes with some issues. But let's start by stating that the Internet revolution is an enormous force for good for people, especially people who are in developing worlds who have, have a lot of disadvantages that we're not dealing with. What I'd like to do is get through as many questions as possible with follow-ups, and I will be asking for mics as well, but let me go through some of them. <laughs> Natasha Mushfiq, how do you encourage corporates and commercials to not just identify the risks from the shifts of power, but to invest in change and move their cumbersome structures, even to realize those structures are cumbersome? Well, first place, technology, uh, technology firms lead the way, but almost every global firm has now figured out that the Internet and basically big data analytics can make their revenue and growth that much faster. In computer science, sort of my area of ex expertise, the story is that if you have a bunch of programmers and you have a whole bunch of data, you can basically solve interesting new problems, inventory, targeting, and so forth. Every large company in the world is doing this. If you're not doing it, you're behind. Governments are very slow by comparison. We are in the presence of literally the best world leader in the world on this issue, President Elvis. So thank you very much for being here. And, it, and the things he's doing are extraordinary. We need to do a lot more of this. We heard, though, and I'm not allowed to mention the name because we're on the record now, um, from a, a senior corporate leader who is conceding, though, that there are significant vulnerabilities still, that the corporate culture still is struggling to understand the velocity and enormity of change. Well, one of the things about technology is that people always assume that what we have today is what will now be true in the future. Right? And it, it has to do with it. There's an old saying that we tend to overestimate what can be done in 18 months and underestimate what can be done in 10 years. It's originally an Isaac Asimov quote, by the way. And the fact of the matter is that, and I know that because I use Google, um, <laughs> the fact of the matter is that we, we, we forget that this is compounding. And that in a decade, right, when everyone that we're dealing with has incredibly more advanced smartphones and network intelligence, the power of data services, the power of computers can produce enormous amounts of intelligence that's useful to humans, the world will change again. Uh, and in my view, in an overwhelmingly good way. But do you think the structures, the corporate structures, and you say governments are still pretty slow and some are still being quite uh, resistant to what is in, in the hope that they, they're in denial, in other words. Do you believe that there is a culture, not just generationally, but among those right at the top, that they understand how significant, profound, irreversible, inexorable all this is? As a general statement, corporations are led by people who don't really grasp in this area what will happen in decades, in a decade, because most people don't. So I, I think it's sort of unfair to criticize them in a special way. The fact of the matter is that it's always a surprise to everybody, but it's coming. So for you as a, as a person, the best thing to do is sort of try to figure out what does the world look like in five and ten years and then work backwards, right? That's the failure of strategy in most corporations. Um, my experience with corporate leaders is everyone now acknowledges this, but there's still confusion as to what to do. So the, the best way to do this is repeat the following buzzwords, smartphones, mobile uh, local data, big data, and uh, machine intelligence. And Get the, get the program around that. Let me try the question in a different way then. The need for adaptability and flexibility in a far more timely way than probably but, in the past. But that's a statement really more about human systems than mm -hmm. technology. Um, give you another example, um, and not to turn this into an ad for Google, but I'm happy to advertise Google. We are busy changing the way enterprises work. We, um, we built a, a set of products called Google Apps and Docs, which are all about sharing. What's interesting is when you convert to this model, your employees spend all their time sharing data with each other because it's all cloud-based. 
This is producing huge improvements in knowledge, effectiveness, and so forth. So technology can help change people's minds about how they use technology in the sense that I remember 20 years ago when I was doing this, we would hire some product person, and their product marketing activity was to so go try to find the literature about our competitors so they could analyze it. Now you just do analysis on the web. We take that for granted today. You couldn't 20 years ago. But surely you have to factor in the human element of all of this using technology. You and uh, Jared Wright, uh, it's a canyon dividing people who understand technology and people charged with addressing the world's toughest geopolitical issues, and no one has built a bridge yet. Well, of course, this is the flourish of our language, but the fact of the matter is, <laughs> the, 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 you know, sort of this is a, an ad to buy the book, I guess. <laughs> no, it, no, it's me putting to you what you've written. <laughs> That's also true. Uh, uh, what I would say is that most human systems don't acknowledge that things are changing as quickly as they are. My observation about foreign policy, because I'm a guest in the foreign policy world, is that many of the debates have been zero-sum debates for a very long time. One group says disarmament is correct, another one says it's too dangerous, you know, on and on and on and on. And, and these, these ideologies, if you will, which are very heartfelt, are locked. My question to you in foreign policy, in business, in government is, what's new? Tell me what's new. It's not a bad principle, by the way, to run a business or a government. What's new? And the answer is, what's new is the empowerment of individuals. Right, so if, in fact, every single person has this extraordinary empowerment, how would it, I'll give you a thought experiment. Imagine, for purposes of discussion, that 10 years ago, America could have dropped into Iraq or Afghanistan one million phones that had the property that they were peer-based, that is, that they could build a mesh network so they could talk to each other without intervention. They were fully encrypted and they were solar powered. Would that have produced a different outcome than the Afghanistan and Iraq wars that America went through in the last decade with you all's help? Um, you want to really think about that because that possibility is now real, right? That there are now mesh networks being built by phones that peer to peer to each other without government intervention. Uh, because of the NSA and other activities, huge amounts of encryption is now going into consumer devices, on and on and on. Let me take a diversion there because in North Korea, they, they are using mobile phones. Yes. What have you said to Kim Jong-un about the durability of his regime because of what is now appearing on the, in the southern area near the border? Mr. Un refused to meet with us. Uh, what message have you sent to him? Uh, we, well, through the Secretary of State. Um, the, our basic strategy with North Korea was that North Korea is the last country that's not connected. Uh, they have about a million phones inside the country. Um, internet ac activity is allowed in universities. If you're a graduate student, you may browse without a supervisor. If you're an undergraduate, you have to have a twin and somebody who watches you. All of your link sites are monitored fully by the government. We're talking serious censorship here. Um, the, best, uh, the, the argument that we made, which we'll see if it is ultimately true, is that the, c the country, the government, and the people will all be better off if they open it up a little bit. Technically, they allow 3G roaming, which they could just turn on. All of a sudden, a country which is enormously poor, enormously poor, would begin to grow. And it would be good for everybody. Let me pick up. We've got uh, issues raised here like data protection, government relations, information management. Robbie Profeta, how does Google balance the requests of individuals to obtain the most suitable and relevant info with the re requests of paying corporations to promote them and their solutions to the individuals in the public space? We, we have a very clear answer. Uh, if a corporation wishes to promote information on Google, we have a very, very nice and very successful advertising industry, which also pays our bills, so thank you very much, and you may advertise. We do not respond to requests to manipulate our results or so forth based on corporate or other interests. That's been true since the founding of the company. Okay, there are quite a few questions here um, on uh, democratic oversight. From German Brooks, can democratic structures as in parliamentary oversight committees provide citizens with assurance that interceptions are proportionate and appropriate? Does civil society need to support the political level for oversight to be effective? Well, in the book, we distinguish between two different categories. So let's start with the people who work in authoritarian governments. Well, I'm just going to use the word autocracies, right? Sort of not Britain, not the US, not Europe, et cetera. Um, those citizens do not have an expectation of privacy from their governments anyway. So they expect to be monitored, often brutally and unfairly. So the conversation for them is very, very different. 
they don't have an expectation of any of the rights that we take for granted, and indeed they understand that they are subject to either arbitrary arrest, arbitrary harassment, et cetera, et cetera. In countries, and we say this in the book, in countries where there is a rubric of democracy, that is that there's an independent court system, there's a set of principles, we in the book state that countries will balance these issues and that they will disagree on a per country basis that they'll come to that outcome on a cultural basis, that the American solution may be different from the British solution, from the European solution, and so forth. That doesn't mean one is right or wrong, but the, one of the goals of democracy is to actually sort these things out. There's a legitimate argument for police activity and actually dealing with evil people. There's also a very real issue of invasion of privacy, uh, which, which many people, including Google, is worried about. What do you believe your relationship is going to be like with sovereign governments in future, whether it be the United States or so many around the world? Look, they are the ones that have the guns, guys. I mean, the fact Guns for what? Well, no, I mean, at the end of the day, you have a government that says, we will put your employees in prison unless you do something. We have to take that very seriously. But we heard a voice uh, earlier today suggesting it's going to become a much more difficult relationship between you and sovereign governments, particularly in the US. We handle every... Every country has different laws, and we do our very best to respect those laws by also respecting the principles that we espouse in terms of open and free information. We care a great deal about an open and free internet. This is why we essentially withdrew to Hong Kong from China. But what about your relationship with the US government in future? Well, there's a lot of pieces of the US government. So in general, we get do along. Do you deal with each of them, or do you? <laughs> you have no choice. <laughs> But uh, could, by the way, the same answer would be true in China and in other countries. But could you sketch out how the events of recent days and weeks which may one? have... Which may have, one? Which one? Do I have to be that specific? Yes, you, you know do. You know exactly what I'm talking about. No, no, I, I want you to be specific. We're on the record. Be specific. I'm, I'm merely <laughs> going to ask you about the relationship between you and a government which is deeply concerned about okay. developments there have been, particularly in the intelligence field, okay, so, and so. the way you, your, your pipes are used to so, transmit information. So, um, Have I been clear? Uh, yes, Good. as clear as you're going to be, I guess. The, the US government is a, compl is a complex organization. And, mm -hmm. and as you know from the history of, of America, uh, it's sort of a compl complicated compromise of interests. The fact of the matter is that we are outraged that the US government, or a piece of the US government, I should say, would intercept data between our servers which are essentially domestic information. I don't know if it's illegal or not. That's a separate discussion. I'm not a lawyer, but it's not okay with us. As a result, what we have done is we have tightened the security between all of our operations, and we're working hard to make it tighter. So one way to say it is that we're now protected against the Chinese and the NSA. I'd like sure. to introduce yourself. Oh, sorry. Aaron Schall. I'm general counsel at the Center for International Governance Innovation. After Operation Aura in 2010, your uh, vice president and general counsel spoke out against the Chinese intervention into your servers, and then there was some discussion about partnering with the NSA to tighten up security there. Is that a relationship that Google has continued, um, and how does that interplay with the recent revelations? When you are attacked by the Chinese in the U.S. law, as again, as I understand it, you call the FBI. The FBI immediately says perhaps the NSA could help, right? And so they were helpful in trying to figure out what the, what the Chinese were up to. But we did not establish a partnership with the NSA. It's very important to state that clearly because, um, especially given what we know now, but this was, I would have answered the same question a year ago. Pete Apps from uh, Reuters. A lot of the rhetoric we've heard, or well, a lot of the things we've heard from, from Google and, and, and Mr. Cohn yourself suggests that you feel in general, that in, if in authoritarian regimes people have more of a say and, and rise up and there's maybe a touch more revolution and may, maybe even governments get ousted, that doesn't make the world a worse place, or to put it another way, it, it makes the world a better place. And I just wanted, wondered where, where you stand on internet freedom producing instability, which in some cases, as in Syria, is going to kill people. I want to be very clear that the people in Syria are being killed by the government and to some degree the rebels, not by the internet. Okay. Somebody's pulling those triggers, and it's not the internet. So I, I want to violently disagree with the framing of the way you asked the question, but let me answer it by saying that we take a position that internet freedom is a good, it's, it's essentially a human right, right? That internet, the ability to express yourself politically, to get your point of view, to discuss what's going on around you is a fundamental, that is our fundamental view. Uh, the fact that, that bad things happen is not a surprise, but the overwhelming benefit of empowering individuals, right, who are good, creative, 
uh, proper. So if the average human being is just a wonderful one, and it's true everywhere in the world, people are shocked by that. Right? Everybody wants the same thing. So we feel very, very strongly that the spread of the internet, the spread of open access, and so forth is a good thing. There is a danger zone. I'll, I'll tell you, a, it's easier if I tell you as a story. Jared and I are, and Jared's my co-author, are in um, Myanmar, Burma, beautiful country if you've not been. And we're in Inlay Lake. And right above us is a terrible violence between um, a, two religious groups, the Buddhists and the, um, uh, sorry, the Muslims. And 37 people are killed, houses are burned, and so forth. Now, naive people like us would say, oh, isn't it great? They had access to the internet. The internet will serve as a calming thing. You know, there will be a sort of a kumbaya moment, right? Which is precisely what did not happen. What happened was that the, the internet was used to, to tell false stories, that people lied. They said there was more than there was, and so forth. So in societies where they're not used to having critical thinking, where they haven't been taught to be questioned authority, where they haven't been taught to say, well, not everything you hear is true, you can get these things. It's important that societies address that quickly. Ten said the president was sitting here back in July, uh, Eric, and um, he said, look, we've got 13 different uprisings in our country. Give us a break. We're trying to solve them all at the same time. At least we've got a peace treaty. But just extending what you've just said and the influence of the digital community, they've now um, given two contracts for um, mobile phone systems. What kind of impact do you believe that will have in a country well, like Burma or Myanmar, given what you've just said about what you saw there? Well, again, uh, I want to be clear that you could make the same argument about telephones. So the, the way to solve this problem is not give these people phones, right? Because that way they can't communicate and actually generate more violence. You see how ludicrous this argument is. So, so from my perspective, the, the important thing is we get people connected. In Burma, what they're doing is they're, they haven't I let these things. They, SIM cards were $5,000 a SIM card. Now they lowered them to $20. So everyone got SIM cards. Unfortunately, then the phone system collapsed from overuse. Guess what? Burmese citizens want to talk to each other on the phone. It's a shock. That was a joke, since we're on the record. That was humor, right? Did you put that to Tencent? Uh, did I put it? Yes. Yes. In mm -hmm. fact, in our, in our meeting with him, my argument, what I, what I did with, with him is I said, look, you want to develop a, uh, you want to develop a broad modern uh, country very quickly. The quickest way to do that is to open up the internet, empower your citizens, do electronic commerce. Think about all the businesses and all the ways in which you could do this. And everyone sort of nodded. But didn't say yes. Well, I, I, it takes a while. Okay. You have uh, an enormous turnover. You're equivalent to a very large state yourselves at Google. Should Google prepare for a more active role in international politics? I, I think to some degree we, we are. As a corporation, we have people now in every interesting country that we operate in. We try very hard to work with the government. Often, the conversation is not at the level of principle that we're having, but more one of familiarization. Things are happening very quickly in these countries. People don't understand the implications of what we're doing. So often an issue can be resolved by showing up in somebody's office. So who makes policy? Is it the executive chairman, or do you have a cabinet? Do you have a foreign well, minister yet? I'm, no, I'm not being facetious. I'm just sort of saying if you have that kind of influence. Google is run, Google is run by the you know, same clowns, as always. And we, uh, we're doing just fine. So we have our own internal processes, but there's a set of people of which I'm one who debate this stuff. And does that time. correspond to a national uh, foreign policy or international policy in uh, any way? Google is a corporation, not a country. Robin Niblett, director of Chatham House. A question I wanted to get over in the context of, of this relationship with governments, and playing back to some of the discussion earlier this morning, if you had a choice, of course you'll say there isn't a choice, but would you rather live in a balkanized system of national jurisdictions in which some of them at least can be really open say the US, Europe, etc., but others might be behind their particular firewalls. Or do you think for a company like Google and for the good of the internet, be better to have, uh, as somebody mentioned this morning, a kind of Bretton Woods for internet governance, but where you'd lose some of that cutting edge openness in the search for compromise? I think it would be a terrible thing if the internet got cut into pieces. And you can imagine that this would occur through the following process. Every country wants more control over information in its, in, inside of its countries, especially if they're not America, uh, and because it's seen as American hegemony today. Um, the principles that, that the internet espouses, which are essentially derived from British principles around free speech and so forth and so on, are a threat to many, many governments. Right? So you can imagine, putting yourself in their mindset, you could see that they would want to control it. Right? So, so I acknowledge that. 
but it hurts their citizens. We've never had a situation where people could speak so freely among each other from so many different countries and races and so forth. To give that up under the premise of your question would be a terrible tragedy for the future of the world. And I'll say furthermore that once you give that stuff up, you don't get it back. Right? That once censorship regimes are in place, filtering and so forth, it's very difficult to turn it back. Uh, my current example, let's think Turkey. So, the Turkish government has all sorts of confusions over or how religious is it versus how secular it is. So they implement their internet policy. And we talk about this in the book. So they implement the internet policy and the question is, can in Turkey, can you get an unfiltered connection in your home? It's a technical question, yes or no. So it turns out after six months of, of trying to figure out the answer to this question, the answer is you cannot. That the, that the way they implemented the internet in Turkey is that in fact there's always a family safe filter. Interesting. What is the definition of family safe? Anyone here know? Good. The Turkish people don't know either. You see my point? You see how it, it happens? And family safe, by the way, they won't disclose what's, what's prohibited. So if you're going to put in some sort of a filter, at least state what you're filtering. In China, using China as a current example, we say this in the book as well, it is illegal for me to tell you what they're filtering, but I'll hint to you that it's an awful lot about uh, embarrassment with respect to the senior leaders of the, of the state. You were very clear in Hong Kong recently about uh, your view of certain things happening there. You've also had meetings in Beijing, uh, and there are new, I was reporting one of them this morning, there is new legislation designed to make it quite risky now to yeah. tweet on Sina Weibo. The, uh, so Jared, Jared and I were both in Beijing and shockingly found ourselves in meetings with the Premier and the President, Mr. Li and Mr. Xi. And I came back with sort of a, a surprising reaction to them. Uh, I thought that they were sincere, I thought that they were clear, and I thought that they were very capable. So this was going into the, um, into the Congress. And they are also clearly not Democrats. Right. There's no confusion over what they are. So I decided to take them at their word, that they are sincere, that they are going to run the country at 7.5% growth, that they're going to address the, the, the motion of rural to urban, they're going to uh, do all this stuff about uh, uh, the, the environmental situation is terrible there, the health issues are terrible. I mean, I think everybody here knows this. So I thought to myself, if that's my view, which it is, how long will that go on? let's say five plus years. It's not going to, most Americans say, oh, you know, it won't work, it'll collapse, you know, these guys are not Democrats and so forth. I don't agree with that. So let's say it'll go on for another five years. What could change it? That was the question. And my answer was a combination of Weibo and WeChat. Weibo uh, is roughly 400 million users. WeChat is roughly 270 million users. The first one is Twitter and Facebook combined. The second one is largely WhatsApp, BBM all combined. The difference is, and they're heavily regulated, but the, to me the most interesting thing about talking to the government from the president all the way through the governors was that they're obsessed about what's going on on the internet, which is why they passed these laws. So the current law is that, it, that Mr. Xi pushed through, which is a horrific law, is that if you have more than 500 people that you in, 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 incite, there's some specific language, you're heavily, heavily criminally liable. Well, everyone in China has more than 500 followers because there's so many Chinese people. Right, so it essentially puts everyone at risk. So how will that change happen? So now I have an opinion. Weibo and WeChat will, they'll move, right? You simply cannot imprison enough Chinese people when they all agree to something. And so the way, the way China really will work is that they've managed to now make the bargain, right? They've managed to actually get themselves connected, which is great. And now that Borg, if you will, to use the Star Trek uh, uh, model, that will move forward, and you won't be able to stop it, even if you don't like it, and it will cause a liberalization of the country, and I think that's a fantastic. Did you say that to them? Uh, yes. It will cause a liberalization yeah. of the country, and they? Uh, you, they become impassive. It's, it, it, it's interesting, when you, when you talk to the North Koreans, and you say things, they, if they don't know how to answer your question, they just say nothing. Where do you define the boundary between the desire for individual privacy and enabling the internet to live up to its potential. In the book, we talk about some of the bad things that can happen 
um, with either mistakes people make, especially as very young people, which stand, stay with them for the rest of their lives. And that, those have to be addressed at the societal level. I just don't think it's reasonable if a 13-year-old makes a stupid mistake online that that mistake then follows them. As a 13-year-old, I made plenty of mistakes, right? But they don't follow me to my, into my adulthood. Uh, with respect to the, the other part of your question, Google actually cares a lot about this. You can use in Google Dashboard Go and actually delete information that Google knows about you, um, that Google knows anyway, that's, not, that, that's under Google's control. Uh, you also can, if you don't wish to be subject to any of this, there is a mode in the Chrome browser called Incognito, which allows you to sort of operate without anybody knowing who you are. So there are plenty of ways for you to participate less or more with respect to that issue, and, and Google has very, very clear policies about the use of all that information, which you can read on Just our website. Just say, how does Google navigate the aforementioned tension between overtness of internet public and the plethora as this question puts it, the plethora of control requests from the various governments? Well, again, each, so, so the, the first part is um, there's a list. Google publishes a transparency report which talks about this. There's roughly 45 countries that we deal with that have various forms of this censorship, of which China is by far the worst. We don't really operate in North Korea because there's not really internet connectivity. They would be first otherwise. Um, so I, to me, since you're not going to have wars over this, hopefully, um, the only thing you can do is convince the other side that the benefits of the internet bring so much benefit to the government, because these are typically autocracies which are more self-interested than interested in the well-being of their citizens. So as an autocracy, they're more interested in, in the benefits that they get from the internet, and so as the internet shows up, it brings some of these other benefits along with it. But you can't fundamentally have both a perfect use of the business part of the internet without also bringing in some of the notions of free expression, um, you know, higher orders of thinking and so forth. Uh, Gottfried Gaston, Queen's University, Belfast. I just want to ask something a little bit different, focusing on the commerce side of things. So what do you see as the next five to ten years as the, the big future, revolutionize rather than evolutionize the, the future of e-commerce? Britain is probably the world leader in e-commerce at least in online advertising. So Britain, as a broad statement, is, um, is a good representative of what you're going to see. Sophisticated consumers that are online, that are buying things online. The transition from web-based buying to mobile phone-based buying is underway now. That's the big shift in our industry. So everybody, including Google, is getting organized around the majority of access being on mobile devices. I think people have seen that the PC market is now in decline. Uh, the tablets and, and mobile phones uh, and, and so-called so phablets, which are a combination of phones and tablets, and every, every combination has now been unleashed. I think it's phenomenal. Um, the Android numbers are more than a billion Android uh, phones in use today, shipping more than 1.5 million per day. So that gives you a sense of the scale of how fast that transition. So the answer fundamentally for e-commerce is it's going to be phone-based. And phone means every combination of size. With that, remember, the phone uh, has a physical location. So you can imagine a situation where you're driving around the street, and the phone says, Eric, you need new jeans, which I do. Um, and on the left is a store that has the jeans you like. And on the right, is there, there's a, a store that has the jeans that are half price. Turn left or turn right, your choice. And in theory, in the future, it'll tell your, your car to turn left or right based on your choice. We're not quite there yet. Have you tested it for your genes? <laughs> <laughs> We're working on that. Uh, anyone else quickly? One last question here from Michael Nelson. As you say, you're a technological determinist. Can technology help improve the quality of government? Well, a lot of what governments do are provide services. And I think it's lost in the political conversation that many of these governments are failing because they were actually inept at delivering the services that citizens wanted. Right, that, that what, what you want is you want a government that's, that delivers basic education, basic health, you know, keeps the, the, uh, keeps the, the, the road safe and clean and, and the police work and all that and lack of corruption. Technology affects all of that in an almost all positive way. You can measure outcomes. You can measure the governments can actually ask people, did they get the things that they said that they were going to get and so forth. It's much harder to be corrupt right, because of, there's an electronic commerce trail. There's so many reasons why the adoption of the government of basic e-government stuff makes governments that much more powerful. Eric Schmidt, thank you very much indeed okay, for sparing time. Thank you so much. Thank you.